Thank you, and I thank you for watching today. May I welcome you to Grace Believers Bible Study. Will you turn in your Bible with me again today to Ephesians chapter 2? I appreciate you watching the broadcast every week, and I hope it's a real blessing to you. I hope you learn some things out of the Scripture that will build you up in the faith if you're already saved, build you up in the faith, establish you in strengthen and encourage you. And if you're not saved, I hope that there will be something in the Scripture that you'll be able to see that it'll cause your eyes of understanding to be enlightened. And may you come to know that Jesus Christ did pay for your sins, that they are already been taken care of, and the salvation free to you, and it's by God's grace, and that alone. Will you read with me today out of Ephesians chapter 2? And in Ephesians chapter 2, would you read from verse 4? Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins. Please observe that the love is a reference to the time when we were dead. We were dead in sins. Even when we were dead in sins, it quickened us together with Christ. In other words, when Jesus Christ died at Calvary, we that are saved by grace through faith died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. That is, by identification with him. By believing in him as our Lord and Savior, we were identified in his death. We were identified in his burial. And we were quickened together with him, raised up with him, and on he's going to say there. Now in verse 5, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And one of the problems that I run into with people about such passages is they say that I just do not understand that. But the great issue involved here has nothing to do with understanding the passage in order that you may believe it. The issue has to do with the fact that salvation is by grace through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And Paul in writing to these Ephesians had they had trusted Christ as their Savior, and having trusted Christ as their Savior, believed in Him as their Savior, Paul is writing, praying that God will give unto them the spirit of understanding. In other words, don't try to get understanding until you believe. Notice, in Ephesians chapter 1, we'll be back to chapter 2 in a moment, Ephesians chapter 1, a reference to Jesus Christ in verse 12. Now verse 13, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you, were believe, you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right, these Ephesians then had trusted Christ as their Savior. They had believed the gospel and they would put their confidence in Christ. They were trusting Him. That is, they trusted that He did what needed to be, do it, be done at Calvary to justify them. Now, in verse 15, Paul said, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, someone had brought word to the Apostle Paul in a Roman prison about these Ephesians having trusted Christ. Someone told him about it. And so he writes this letter. In verse 16, he said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know some things. Please observe that these things that he's writing about in this passage are not things that they had to understand in order to trust Christ as their Savior. They trusted Christ right out of the darkness. They trusted Christ believing the message of the gospel. And having trusted Christ, the passage is written to make them understand some things that they could not have understood before believing. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that by the Spirit of God we know these things. And he said, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. And so 
an understanding of Bible truth comes through revelation through the Holy Spirit. And unless an individual has the Holy Spirit, they'll have a problem getting that truth. And you cannot have the Holy Spirit as your leader without believing the gospel. So, trust Christ as your Savior is the, is the first step. Believe the gospel is the first step. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first step that you have to take. And once you've taken that step, once you've honestly, <clears throat> as it were, turned your salvation over to the Lord, trusting that God will save you if you believe in Christ, once you've taken that step, then the other things begin to come into line. But you can't know the things of God until you've trusted Christ as your Savior, and then you begin to learn these things. Now in verse uh, 6, God hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So I've got the future out here. The future derision, after that of course the second coming of the Lord and the millennial reign of Christ. So, in the future then, God is going to show something through the church, which is the body of Christ. God is going to reveal something through the church, the body of Christ. Now, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, God Almighty saves us to do good works. You don't do good works to get saved. Uh, the problem with the religious system today is that they're trying to get people to do good so that they'll be acceptable to God, but that's not the way it works. The Bible said there are none that are good. The Bible said there's none that doeth good. You notice one of the greatest contradictions that is revealed in religious teaching today is the idea of them teaching you to do good so God will save you. Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that there is none that doeth good. Well, if there's none that doeth good, then how can an individual teach people to do good in order to gain salvation? Look in Romans chapter 3 in your Bible. In Romans chapter 3, Verse 9, what then are we, and he's referring to Israel, the Jews, he's referring to them, are we better than they, that is the Gentiles? No and no wise. For we before prove both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In other words, there is none in the world today based upon their works righteous. Now, a man wrote this who had been circumcised the eighth day. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Hebrew. He's a Pharisee. On and on. Jesus Christ said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, this man here is a Pharisee. And he said, there's none righteous. Well, then, why would you believe a religious leader today trying to convince you that you can work righteousness and gain admission into heaven. There is none righteous, he said. Uh, verse uh, 11, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. People say, well, I saw God in an old-fashioned altar. Well, God said you didn't. He said, there is none that seeketh after God. Uh, the point is that the motivation of the flesh is always bad. The flesh never motivates you to do that which is right. It never motivates you to do that which is good. Paul said, O wretched man that I am, he said, I'm carnal, sold under sin. He said, the good that I would, I find that I do not. He said, that which I would not, I find that that's what I do. If then I do that I would not, there's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And on and on he goes. You know, this Bible from Genesis through Revelation seems to have been written by someone with the idea of bringing to your mind the fact that you're condemned. 
it seems to have been written by someone with the idea in mind to make you know that you're not any good. To make you know that there aren't any good people in the world, there aren't any people that do good in the world. They're all bad and the things they do are bad. When, when lined up with the Lord Jesus Christ, compared to Him, all our works are bad. In Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 12, there is none, uh, I'm sorry, they're all gone out of the way, they're together become unprofitable, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. Well then, if you're going to do good to get into heaven, you're out, because there is none that doeth good, no, not one. That includes every religious leader in the world today. Doesn't make any difference who they are. Doesn't make any difference if the Pope or Billy Graham or whatever your religious leader is. The Bible said there is none that doeth good. The Bible said there's none righteous. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then why would you believe an individual today telling you that if you be good, you can go to heaven? When the Bible said you can't be good. The Bible said there is none good. The Bible said you can't do good. The Bible said all are bad. The Bible said all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2 again. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, For by grace you are saved through faith. In other words, salvation then is by believing in Jesus Christ, trusting Him. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words, if you, if you could take the help of Almighty God and gain your salvation, then you'd boast. And so either God saves you or you end up in hell. There is no way that God is going to help you save yourself. There is no way that God's going to give you the power to save yourself. If you trust Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, then God will save you. If you reject Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, then God Almighty will reject you. It's as simple as that. Uh, verse uh, 10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, then God Almighty created us new creatures in Christ. We that trust Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, called new creatures in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5. All right, then He created us in Christ Jesus unto good works. So God Almighty saved us that we might do good works. Who can do good works then? Those that are going to heaven. Then you can't do good works to go to heaven. Only those who already are going to go to heaven can do the good works. Well, how can that be then? because we're carnal, sold under sin, and our motivation is all fouled up. So you have to trust Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, believing that He died for you at Calvary. Just simply by faith, turn the whole thing over to Him and say, either Jesus Christ saved me or I'll end up in hell. And because that's the way it is, if God doesn't save you, you're going to hell anyhow. And there ain't no need for you to go to some altar somewhere and start praying and thinking that you can get God's favor by praying. You can confess your sins till hell freezes over, but that is not going to get favor with God. How can you have favor with God? By believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By grace, he said, you're saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is totally and completely based upon righteousness. You've got to have the righteousness of Almighty God to be saved, and if you don't have that righteousness, you're going to end up in hell. Well, how can you get that righteousness? There is only one way that God will do that for you. God will give you His righteousness if you'll trust Christ, and it is the righteous that God saves. Righteousness is by faith, and the righteous are taken out of the world someday into heaven based upon their faith in Christ. All right, verse 11. Wherefore remember that you being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, all right? We've got that which is in the future referred to in verse 7, the ages to come. We've got that which is past referred to in verse 11. Time passed, these Gentiles to whom this thing is written, they were without Christ. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now 
in Christ Jesus. You who sometime were far from made nigh by the blood of Christ. All right, I've got time past and I've got that which is now and that which is in the future. So the Gentiles, such as we, time past, they were without Christ. Why were they without Christ? Because they were not allied with Israel, because they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, they were not in the covenants of promise, and therefore they had no hope and were without God in the world. How about the future? Well, these Gentiles in the future are going to be in derision. The Gentiles that you know of in the world today that hear the gospel of Christ and reject Him as the Lord and Savior are going to be given a strong delusion, the Bible said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said, God will give them strong delusion that they should believe a lie and be damned. Who? He said, those who receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And in other words, they will not receive this truth. They will not trust Christ as their Savior. They will not believe the gospel in this dispensation of the gospel. Paul said he was given the dispensation of the gospel according to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17, along in there. Now, during this dispensation of the gospel, there is a preaching of the gospel. What is that gospel? That Jesus Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now shall be saved. Believe what? That Jesus Christ truly did pay for all your sins at Calvary. So I've got time past, I've got now, and I've got that which is to come. Now notice something about time past again. Go back to Romans 3. In Romans chapter 3, these Ephesians to whom he writes now, they were without Christ. Romans chapter 3 verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. But now, but now, right in here, the righteousness of God without the law. And the righteousness of God is by faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God that is by faith in Jesus Christ, bless your soul, is based upon the fact that Christ died for your sins. And there ain't no need. Now don't let somebody pull your leg about this thing. Don't let somebody in this city screaming and yelling about the hypers and the dry cleaners and whatever don't let them throw you off. In Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so forth, it was never preached that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Go back and look. Peter didn't know in Acts chapter 2 that Jesus Christ died for his sins. And the righteousness of God that is by the faith of Christ is based upon the fact that Christ died for your sins. That's clear in the scripture. But now, he said, the righteousness of God. In other words, back there, in other words, somewhere time past changes to but now. It's got to. There has to be somewhere that there is a line drawn, so to speak, and that which is beyond that line is time past. That which is this side of that line is now. So there is somewhere in the Bible that somebody is saved by grace through faith. It can't be by the law. Hold on to Romans 3 and go to Romans 11. In Romans 11, look at verse 5. Even so then at this present time also, there we are again, see, this present time. Even so then at this present time also, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Let's see about that. Now, Romans chapter 3, he said in time past, 
They were under the law. Justification was by the law. Let's see what Jesus Christ said. Go back to Matthew, please. And turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, and in Matthew 8, there are some lepers that were cleansed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 3, Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was clean. Jesus saith unto him, See that thou tell no man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Why, Jesus Christ not only taught people to keep the law, he taught them to offer blood sacrifice. Well, if he's telling a man to offer sacrificial offerings unto God, he sure is this world isn't teaching Jesus Christ that he himself is the one sacrifice offered for sin forever. It can't be the same. You can't have it both ways. Why would Jesus Christ teach a man go and offer a blood sacrifice according to Mosaic law while at the same time teaching I fulfilled all of those sacrificial offerings and there are no more. Trust me, I am the one sacrifice. Can't have it the both ways. He told the man to go offer the sacrifice. Go back to Romans chapter, I mean to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Notice Jesus Christ says in verse uh, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, and that's after the millennium. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, the law be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Hold of the passage. Hold on there. You'll have Romans 3 in one hand and Matthew 5 in one hand. Now go to Matthew 16. Let's compare Matthew 16 with Matthew 5. In Matthew chapter 16, notice in verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, Peter then is given a special position of authority in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, all the twelve, look at them in Matthew 19. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, after Jesus Christ had told a rich man there, that he had to sell everything and give it to the poor. Look what Peter said to him. Verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, Peter then is going to reign in the kingdom, on a throne, Peter is given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Somebody said that in Acts chapter 2 through 4, 5, so forth, that he unlocked the doors or the gates or whatever as the entrance for the Jews. In Acts chapter 10, he did the same for the Gentiles, they say. Well, if that be the case then, it won't change what I'm preaching and teaching here. Jesus Christ told Peter, if anybody breaks one of the least of these commandments, or if he teaches men so, he'll be the least in the kingdom of heaven. 
but the man that does them shall be called great. In other words, Jesus taught Peter and the other apostles to keep the law. That is absolutely clear. Notice in verse 20. Go back to Matthew 5, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, and we'll start again in verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees were by the law, as in Deuteronomy chapter 6, as in the Old Testament scriptures. Their righteousness was by the law. And he said unto these people on the Sermon on the Mount, except your righteousness exceed that, you'll in no wise enter. They obviously knew that they were to keep the law. Now go back to Matthew 3 again. In Matthew chapter 3, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, verse 19, Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, Jesus Christ taught the law, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. In other words, the man under the law then saw himself guilty by the law and offered the blood sacrifice that the law claimed, that the law told about in Leviticus and on and on. He became guilty, offered the sacrifices. Acts chapter 2 through 4, 5, 6, and 7, they didn't know that Jesus Christ was the sacrifice. They didn't know that Jesus Christ had died for their sins. Peter said, by wicked hands he's been crucified. You've killed him. Why, Peter said, Lord, you're not going to die. We're not going to permit that. Verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law, and on and on and on. Go to verse 26, To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, and on and on. In other words, now then, righteousness is by faith of Christ. Romans chapter 3, verse 22, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Verse 23, For all have sinned and come short, and on and on and on. You want to be righteous? Righteousness is by believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It'll be the righteousness of God that'll be put to your account, not the righteous of the law. That's in the past. But now, in this dispensation of the gospel,